Okay, this is chapter 17 of the Maternal Newborn Postpartum Physiological Adaptations. It is important to provide comfort measures for the client during the fourth stage of labor. This recovery period starts with birth of the placenta and includes at least the first two hours after birth. Also during this stage, parent-newborn bonding should begin to occur. The main goal during the immediate postpartum period is to prevent postpartum hemorrhage. Other goals include assisting in a client's recovery, identifying deviations in the expected recovery process, providing comfort measures and pharmacological pain relief, providing client education about newborn and self-care, and providing baby-friendly activities to promote infant and family bonding. Physical changes. The postpartum period, also known as puri, puri perineum, includes physi- physiological and psychological adjustments. This period is the interval between birth and the return of the reproductive organs to their non-pregnant state. Although traditionally this has been considered to last six weeks, this time frame varies among postpartum clients. Physiological changes consist of uterine inv- involution, lochia flow, cervical involution, decrease in vaginal distension, alteration in ovarian function and menstruation and cardiovascular, urinary tract, breast and gastrointestinal tract changes. The greatest risk during the postpartum period are hemorrhage, shock, and infection. Oxytocin, a hormone released from the pituitary gland, coordinates and strengthens uterine contractions. Breastfeeding stimulates the release of endogenous oxytocin from the pituitary gland. Exogenous oxytocin can be administered postpartum to improve the quality of the uterine contractions. A firm and contracted uterus prevents excessive bleeding and hemorrhage. Uncomfortable uterine cramping is referred to as after pains. After birth of the placenta, hormones, estrogen, progesterone, and placental enzyme insulase decrease, thus resulting in decreased blood glucose, estrogen, and progesterone levels. Decreased estrogen is associated with breast engorgement, diaphoresis, which is profuse perspiration, and diuresis, which is increased formation and excretion of urine, of excess extracellular fluid accumulated during pregnancy. Decreased estrogen diminishes vaginal lubrication. Local dryness and intercourse discomfort can persist until ovarian function returns and menstruation resumes. Decreased progesterone results in an increase in muscle tone throughout the body. Decreased placental enzyme insulase results in reversal of the diabetogenic effects of pregnancy, which lowers blood glucose levels immediately in the puriperineum. Human chronic gondrotropin, or HCG, disappears from the blood quickly, but some can be detected for up to four weeks postpartum. Lactating and non-lactating clients differ in the timing of the first ovulation and the resumption of menstruation. In lactating clients, the blood prolactin levels remain elevated and suppress ovulation. The return of ovulation is influenced by breastfeeding frequency, the length of each feeding, and the use of supplementation. The infant's suck is also believed to affect prolactin levels. Length of time to the first postpartum ovulation is approximately six months. In non-lactating clients, prolactin declines and reaches the pre-pregnant level by three weeks postpartum. Ovulation occurs seven to nine weeks after birth, and menses resumes by 12 weeks postpartum. Assessment. Postpartum assessments immediately following birth include monitoring vital signs, uterine firmness, and its location in relation to the umbilicus, uterine position in relation to the bend line of the abdomen, and amount of vaginal bleeding. A focused postpartum physical assessment should include assessing the client's bubble. B for breasts, U for uterus, this is fundal height, uterine placement and consistency, B for bowel and GI function, B for bladder function, L for lochia, which is color, odor, consistency, and amount, which is COCA, E for episiotomy, edema, ecmosis, and approximation, vital signs to include pain assessment and teaching needs. Lab tests can include urinalysis and CBC with monitoring of HGB, HCT, and WBC and platelet counts. 
If the rubella and RH status are unknown, tests should be performed to determine their status. Uterus. Physical changes of the uterus include involution of the uterus. Involution occurs with the contractions of the uterine smooth muscle, whereby the uterus returns to its pre-pregnant state. The uterus also rapidly decreases in size from approximately 1,000 grams at the end of the third stage of labor to 60 to 80 grams at six weeks postpartum, with the fundal height steadily descending into the pelvis, approximately one finger breadth per day. At the end of the third stage of labor, the uterus should be palpable at midline and two centimeters below the umbilicus. One hour after birth, the fundus, or the top portion of the uterus, should rise to the level of the umbilicus. Every 24 hours, the fundus should descend approximately one to two centimeters. It should be halfway between the symphysis pubis and the umbilicus by six days postpartum. After about two weeks, the uterus should lie within the true pelvis and should not be palpable. Assessment. Assess the fundal height, uterine placement, and uterine consistency at least every eight hours after the recovery period has ended. Explain the procedure to the client. Position the client supine with their knees slightly flexed so that the fundal height is not influenced by positioning. Document the position and location of the uterus by the number of finger breasts and according to the facility policy. Determine whether the fundus is firm or boggy. If the fundus is boggy, which is not firm, lightly massage the fundus in a circular motion. Patient-centered care. Administer oxytoxics intramuscularly or IV after the placenta is delivered to promote uterine contractions and prevent hemorrhage. Oxytoxics include oxytocin, methylgonovane, and carb- carboprost. Mesoprotosol, a prosglandin, can also be administered. Monitor for adverse effects of medications. Oxytocin and mesoprotosol can cause hypotension. Methylgonovine, ergonovine, and carboprost can cause hypertension. Lochia. <clears throat> Lochia is post-birth, post-birth uterine discharge that contains blood, mucus, and uterine tissue. The amount of lochia is similar to a heavy menstrual period after about two hours after birth, then decreases gradually at a consistent rate. Three stages of lochia. Lochia rubra, dark red color, bloody consistency, fleshy odor, can contain small clots, transient flow increases during breastfeeding and upon rising, lasts one to three days after birth, Remind the client that they can experience a surge of discharge upon arising after lying in bed for an extended period of time. This should not be mistaken for a hemorrhage. Lochia serosa is a pinkish brown color and serosanguinous consistency, can contain small clots and leukocytes, lasts from approximately day 4 to day 10 after birth. And Lochia alba is a yellowish white creamy color, fleshy odor can consist of mucus and leukocytes, lasts from approximately day 10 up to six weeks postpartum. Lochia amount is assessed by the quantity of saturation on the perineal pad as being scant, which is less than 2.5 centimeters, light, which is 2.5 to 10 centimeters, moderate, which is more than 10 centimeters, and heavy, which is one pad saturated within two hours. Excessive blood loss, one pad saturated in 15 minutes or less, or pooling of blood under the buttocks. Patient-centered care. Nursing interventions for abnormal lochia include notifying the provider and performing prescribed interventions based on the case of the abnormality. Manifestations of abnormal lochia. Excessive spurting of bright red blood from the vagina, possibly indicating a cervical or vaginal tear. Numerous large clots and excessive blood loss. Saturation of one pad in 15 minutes or less can indicate hemorrhage. Foul odor, which is suggestive of infection. Persistent heavy lochia rubra in the early postpartum period beyond day three, which can indicate retained placental fragments. And continual, continued flow of lochia serosa or alba beyond the normal length of time can indicate endometriitis, especially if it is accompanied by fever, pain, or abdominal tenderness. Cervix, vagina, and perineum. Physical changes. The cervix is so- soft. The cervix is soft directly after birth and can be edematous, bruised, and have small lacerations. 
Within two to three days postpartum, it shortens, regains its form, and becomes firm with the OS gradually closing. Lacerations to the cervix can decrease the amount of cervical mucus. External OS will no longer have a round dimple shape and will have a slit-like appearance. <clears throat> the vagina, which has distended gradually, returns to its pre-pregnancy size with the re reappearance of rouge, <clears throat> rouge and thickening of the vaginal mucosa. Muscle tone is never restored completely. Breastfeeding increases the incidence of vaginal dryness and atrophy. The soft tissues of the perineum can be erythematous and edematous, especially in areas of an episiotomy or lacerations. Hematoma or hemorrhoids can be present. Pelvic floor muscles can be overstretched and weak. Assess for cervical, vaginal, and perineal healing. Observe the perineum for erythema, edema, and hematoma. Assess episiotomy and lacerations for approximate approximation, drainage, quantity, and quality. Initial healing occurs in two to three weeks and complete healing occurs in four to six months. Perennial tenderness, laceration, and episiotomy. Promote measure to help soften the client's stools. Promote comfort measures. Apply ice cold packs to the perineum for the first 24 hours to reduce edema and provide aesthetic effect. Anesthetic effect. Do not apply directly to the perineum. Heat therapies such as hot packs, moist heat, and sitz baths can be used to increase circulation and promote healing and comfort. Encourage sitz baths at a hot or cold temperature for at least 20 minutes for at least twice a day. Administer analgesics such as non-opioids like acetaminophen, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories such as ibuprofen, and opioids such as codeine and hydrocodone for pain and discomfort. Opioid analgesia can be administered via patient-controlled analgesia or PCA pump after cesarean birth. Continuous epidural infusions can also be used for pain control after cesarean birth. Apply topical anesthetics like benzocaine spray to the client's perennial area as needed or witch hazel compresses or hemorrhoidal creams to the rectal area for hemorrhoids. Wash both hands thoroughly before and after voiding. Use a squeeze bottle filled with warm water or antiseptic solution after each voiding to cleanse the perennial area. Blot the perennial area to clean it after toileting starting from front to back. Breasts. Physical changes of the breasts include the secretion of colostrum and with which, occur, which occurs during pregnancy and two to three days immediately after birth. Milk is produced about 72 to 96 hours after the birth of a newborn. Assessment. The nurse should perform a physical assessment of the client's breasts and determine the client's choice regarding breastfeeding. Colostrum or early milk transitions to mature milk by about 72 to 96 hours after birth. This transition is referred to as milk coming in. Engorgement or fullness of the breast tissue is a result of lymphatic circulation, milk production, and temporary vein congestion. This breast, the breast will appear tight, tender, warm, and full. Inform clients who do not plan to breastfeed that this will resolve on its own, but breast binders or support bras can be used or an ice pack or cabbage leaves can be applied. Inform clients who plan, plan to breastfeed that breast care and frequent feedings will prevent or manage engorgement. Observe for erythema, breast tenderness, cracked nipples, and indications of mastitis, which is an infection of the milk duct of the breast with concurrent flu-like manifestations. Declare, determine the client's availability to assist the newborn with lat latching on and ensure the newborn has latched on correctly to prevent sore nipples. Ineffective newborn feeding patterns are related to maternal dehydration, maternal discomfort, newborn positioning, or difficulty with the newborn latching onto the breast. Patient-centered care. Promote, promote early breastfeeding within the first one to two hours after birth. Encourage early demand feeding for the client who chooses to breastfeed. Assist the client into comfortable position and have them try various positions during breastfeeding. The four traditional positions for breastfeeding are football, hold under the arm, cradle across the lap, modified cradle, and side lying. Explain how varying prevent positions can prevent nip nipple soreness. Cardiovascular system and fluid and hemolytic status. 
physical changes in the cardiovascular system during the postpartum period, the cardiovascular system undergoes a decrease in blood volume during the postpartum period related to blood loss during childbirth. The average blood loss is 300 to 500 mLs, which is 10% of blood volume, in an uncomplicated vaginal birth and 500 to 1,000 mLs, which is 15 to 30% of blood volume for a cesarean birth. Diaphoresis and diuresis occur within the first two to five days after birth and rid the body of the excess fluid accumulated during the last part of pregnancy. Weight loss due to lochia, birth, and diuresis of about 19 pounds during the first five days after birth. Hypovolemic shock does not usually occur in response to the normal blood loss of labor and birth because of expanded blood volume of pregnancy and the readjustment of the maternal vasculature, which occurs in response to the following elimination of the placenta, and rapid reduction in the size of the uterus, putting more blood into the maternal systemic circulation. In blood values, coagulation factors and fibrinogen levels during the puriperineum. Hematocrit levels drop moderately for three to four days, then begin to increase and reach non-pregnant levels by week eight postpartum. During the first four to seven days after birth, white blood cell values between 20,000 and 25,000 are common and can rise as high as 30,000. This is called postpartum leukocytosis, and it is how the body prevents infection and aids in healing. Coagulation factors and fibrinogen levels increase during pregnancy and remain elevated in the immediate postpartum period. Hypercoagulability predisposes the postpartum client to thrombus formation and thromboembolism. Vital sign changes. Blood pressure is usually unchanged with an uncomplicated pregnancy but can have insignificant slight transient increase. Significant decrease from baseline could indicate bleeding. Significant increase could indicate gestational hypertension or preeclampsia and requires evaluation. Possible orthostatic hypotension within the first 48 hours postpartum can occur immediately after standing up with manifestations of faintness or dizziness resulting from splenic visceral internal organs engorgement that can occur after birth. Encourage the client to sit on the side of the bed prior to standing up. Elevation of pulse, stroke volume, and cardiac output for the first hour postpartum occurs when it gradually decreases to the pre-pregnant state baseline by six to eight weeks. Due to elevations in stroke volume during the first two days after birth, the heart rate can be slow as 40 minutes, 40 a minute. This is called puroperal bradycardia, and this is common finding. Tachycardia in the postpartum period should be evaluated. Elevation of temperature to 100.4 degrees resulting from dehydration after labor during the first 24 hours can occur, but should return to normal after 24 hours postpartum. Elevation after 24 hours or that persists after two days could indicate infection. Assess for cardiovascular and vital sign changes and monitor blood component changes. Compare with baseline pregnancy vital signs. <clears throat> Assess pedal pulses, skin turgor, and the legs and feet for endema. Nursing actions for alterations and findings include notifying the provider and performing prescribed interventions based on the cause of the alteration. Encourage adequate fluid intake, early ambulation, apply anti-embolism stockings to the lower extremities, and administer medications as prescribed. Gastrointestinal system and bowel function. <clears throat> Operative ba- vaginal birth or forceps and vacuum assisted and anal sphincter lacerations increase the risk of temporary postpartum anal incontinence that usually resolves within six, within six months. Wow. Physical changes in the gastrointestinal system. Increased appetite following birth, constipation, and hemorrhoids. The nurse should assess the GI system, including bowel function. Assess for reports of hunger. Expect the client to have a good appetite. Assess for bowel signs and the return of normal bowel function. Spontaneous bowel movement might not occur for two to three days after birth, secondary to decreased intestinal muscle turn, muscle turn during label and puriperinum pre-labor diarrhea, dehydration, or medication adverse effects. Encourage interventions to promote bowel function, early ambulation, increase fluids, and intake of high-fiber foods. 
administer stool softeners like docusate sodium to prevent constipation. Enemas and suppositories are contraindicated for clients who have third or fourth degree perennial lacerations. Flatus is common after cesarean birth. Encourage the client to ambulate or rock in a chair to promote passage of flatus. Urinary system and bladder function. The urinary system can show evidence of the following urinary retention secondary to loss of bladder elasticity and tone and or loss of bladder sensation resulting from trauma, medications, or anesthesia. A distended bladder as a result of the urinary retention can cause infection, uterine autonomy, and displacement to one side. The ability of the uterus to contract is also lessened. Postpartal diuresis with increased urinary output begins within 12 hours of birth. Assessment. Assess the urinary system and bladder function. Assess the client's ability to void. Assess the bladder elimination pattern. Assess of urine diuresis as normal within the first two to three days after birth. Assess for evidence of a distended bladder. Fundal height above the umbilicus or baseline level. Fundus displaced from the midline or over the side. Bladder bulges above the pubis symphysis and excessive lucia. <clears throat> Assess the client to void within six to eight hours after birth. Of unable to void, catheterization can be required. Encourage the client to empty their bladder frequently to prevent possible displacement of the uterus and autonomy. Measure the client's first few voidings after birth to assess for bladder emptying. Musculoskeletal system. Physical changes of the musculoskeletal system involve a reversal of the musculoskeletal adaptations that occurred during pregnancy by weeks by six to eight weeks after birth, the joints return to their pre-pregnant state and are completely restabilized. The feet, however, can remain permanently increased in size. Muscle tone begins to be restored throughout the body. With the removal of progesterone's effect following birth of the placenta, the rectus abdominis muscles of the abdomen and the pubococcygeus muscle tone are restored following placental expulsion and return to the pre-pregnant state about six weeks postpartum. Assess the musculoskeletal system for changes. Assess the abdominal wall for diastasis recti, which is separation of the rectus muscle. It usually resolves within six weeks. Prevent falls by encouraging the client to wear non-skid slippers or socks, assisting the client with getting out of bed and instructing the client to call for assistance. Perform postpartum strengthening, strengthening exercises, starting with simple exercises and then gradually progressing to more strenuous ones. Following cesarean birth, birth postpone abdominal exercises until about six, four to six weeks after birth or follow recommendations of the provider. Immune system. Review the status of the following. Rubella. A client who is not immune to rubella or has a negative or low titer is administered a subcutaneous injection of rubella vaccine or, me or measles, mumps, and rubella MMR vaccine during the postpartum period to protect a subsequent fetus from malformations. The client should not get pregnant for four weeks following the immunization. RH. All RH negative clients who have newborns who are RH positive must be given RHOD immune goblin administered IM within 72 hours of the newborn being born to suppress antibody formation in the mother. The nurse should check to see if the client has not been sensitized prior to administering the RHOD immune globulin. Observe the client for at least 20 minutes post-administration for an allergic reaction. Test the client who receives both a live virus vaccine, such as rubella vaccine and rho D immune globulin after three months to determine whether immunity to rubella has been developed. Varicella. If the client has no immunity, varicella vaccine is administered before discharge. The client should not get pregnant for one month following the immunization. A second dose of vaccine is given at four to eight weeks. Tetanus diphtheria, a cellar pertussis vaccine. <clears throat> the, the vaccine is recommended for clients who have not previously received it. It is also recommended for people who are going to be around a baby frequently if they have not received the vaccine previously. Administer prior to discharge or as soon as possible in the postpartum period. Breastfeeding is not contraindicated. Comfort level. Assessment and interventions. Assess pain related to episiotomy, lacerations, incisions, after pains, and sore nipples. Assess location type, administer pain medications, 
<clears throat> psychosocial. During the postpartum period, a client can experience many different emotions due to hormonal changes. Monitor for conditions such as postpartum blues and depression during the postpartum period. Allow verbalization of feelings, assess emotional status, observe for bonding with newborn, monitor for manifestation of postpartum blues or depression, decreased appetite, difficulty sleeping, decreased interactions with others, and lack of communication. Patient-centered care. Encourage skin-to-skin -skin contact with their baby after birth. Document interactions and bonding concerns. Encourage rooming in with the baby in the client's room at all times. Provide support and initiate referrals as needed for counseling.